podcast. Welcome to today's edition of Daytime's Di- Daytime Dialogue. It is really my pleasure today to welcome Keshet Star. For those of you who don't know who Keshet is, uh, she's the executive director of a very important organization, a national, international organization called ORA, which has some connections to our shul at KINS because of Josh Ross, who was one of the early advocates for ORA. ORA is the organization for the resolution of Agunot and has done extraordinary work to help really resolve the problem of Agunot in our community. I'm thrilled that Keshet is with us. I'll just give you one more piece of background. She is a graduate both of uh, uh, University of Michigan and also University of Pennsylvania Penn Law School. Uh, she's very highly qualified, a Wexner Fellow, and uh, it's great to see you. Thank you for joining us, Keshet. And uh, really, I just want to enter into a bit of a conversation for the next half hour. So let's talk about Ora for a minute. How did they find you? How did you get involved with Ora? So it's a great question, and it's really kind of hashkacha because it, it sort of happened in this roundabout way. But I went to law school wanting to do something with social justice and family law, maybe foster care. And I ended up interviewing with a legal services agency for an internship. And I had put in, in the lottery for the interview, didn't get it. In the end, someone canceled, and I was in the law school in a suit, so I took it. And I ended up doing this internship that was focused on domestic abuse work in the firm community, got super interested in it, really thought this is what I wanted to do. And after law school, did a fellowship for a year and then found out about ORA through my friend's mom, actually, who <laughs> had heard about the opening. And yeah, the rest is history. So really couldn't have sort of plotted it out, but it worked out wonderfully. And- just to give people a perspective, is there an estimate of how many women, unfortunately, are abnormal today in America? Also a very good question. It's really hard to get an estimate because if we're going to count Aguna, we need to know who they are and when do you officially become an Aguna, and there are some debates on that. The estimates out there vary from a couple hundred to a couple thousand, and we try to think about it as almost like a continuum of impact, that you have people who have been trying to get a get for seven years and really fit all of the classical Aguna definitions. And you also have people who haven't even started the divorce process yet, but are really nervous about, you know, what if I don't get my get? And that helps them make a decision about what to do. So you have a lot of people impacted, even outside of the sort of official numbers. So of the num- of those 200 to 2,000, how many are ORA involved in today? So we work with about 75 Agunod at a specific time. And we also run a helpline where people call with questions. And we work with about 300 people every year through that program. And so overall, we're working with, again, close to 400 people who have a get concern. And they might be at a different point in the process, but we always love to get involved as early as we can and help steer the situation in a positive direction, as opposed to coming in when a lot has happened and everything is really messy. So of those, you know, how many of the cases would you say are the really complicated ones versus the ones that just need to be you know, directed, shepherded through the process to make sure it happens right? So I would say of our kind of 70 to 75 case range, those are really complicated cases. We only take a case on if it's already been through the baked in process, it's gone through the religious court system and gotten stuck, or there's a ruling and you have to do something with that ruling. And very often these are cases with a prior history of domestic abuse, someone's in prison, someone has an addiction problem. There are kind of often additional factors that just make this case really hard to move forward. Now, one of the ways to resolve a lot of those issues is also with the prenup. (coughs) As a rabbi, I don't do weddings unless if there's a prenup done. And uh, what I have found in my personal experiences, there have been three cases where I've been involved in where there was a potential Aguna problem where the husband didn't want to give a get until something. And each time when I sent to his lawyer a copy of the prenup, the get was taken care of within a week or so. 
Uh, is that common, the common response? Absolutely. And I actually like to tell these stories because I think it's so important for people to realize that the prenup is effective. I worked on a case where the wife had a prenup, but she had lost it. She didn't even physically have it. And I was speaking to the husband's rabbinic advocate, and he said, well, if she wants to get, she has to do this and she has to do that. I was giving a whole list. And I said, you know, they signed a prenup, and I kind of worded it carefully because we didn't actually have it. And he said, oh, she signed a prenup, they signed a prenup, okay, fine, we'll do the get on Thursday. That there's kind of this like game over attitude of oh, there's a prenup, but we can't use this as a tool anymore. And that's good because it shouldn't be used as a tool. So it's really super effective and it also pushes the get much earlier in the process, which I think is so fundamental that often with a really nasty divorce case, as it goes on month after month and year after year, it gets so much more you know, acrimonious. And so if you can get the get done earlier before things really fall apart on a much bigger scale, you can prevent some of these really tragic cases that end up you know, working with our advocacy team. And do you have a lot of protests? You know, I know the stories, I've seen pictures where People protest out somebody's house or outside their place of business. Rav Schechter has been very supportive of that. Is it still going on, those kinds of things? It is, but it often surprises people that it's only about 10% of our cases. We only protest if we've tried everything else, to be frank, because we're very careful not to put someone in a situation where they feel like they've already lost everything and there's no return. So we're pretty careful about it. And a lot of the work we do is much more behind the scenes, trying to open up communication between the parties, between the religious courts, the rabbis, trying to sort of get the helpful people involved so we can move the case forward. So we have the protests when we need them, but they're actually not our immediate go-to. And Aura is a nonprofit. Aura, how's Aura supported? Very, very good question. So we're a nonprofit, and basically we get about a third of our our, our funding from foundations and grants, about a third from really large gifts. And another third is actually from a really consistent base of people who just give us, you know, $50 here and 180 there and 18 there. And that really adds up. So we're actually really fortunate to have this awesome base of uh, including a lot of young people who help keep the work going with that consistent giving. And we have some amazing monthly donors as well who we're very grateful to. So do you have like one of your favorite stories of success that you normally share with people that you could share with us? Absolutely. I guess I'll, I'll share two stories if I can and make them both a little quicker. We have um, one case that happened very recently where the case went public and within 24 hours of the case going public, a get was given. And it's not normally that fast, so we, we did get lucky. But I think it really highlights the fact that in many cases, the person wants both things. They want to hold on to the get and use the get as leverage, but they also want everyone to think that they're a really wonderful, nice person. And once it becomes impossible to have both, it really creates a counter pressure that encourages the get. So and I guess another, oh, go ahead. What does it mean going public? Great question. So that's when we do a social media campaign or a rally. And that's where we're really going to the community saying, hey, if anyone knows, you know, Bob Jones to make up a name, you know, you should encourage him to give a get. And we take that step of going public very seriously. We work really hard to avoid it because again, there are risks involved, but we do see that in some cases, that's what it takes. And the person really, they don't want to be seen as the mean get refuser. They don't want that label. And I think the key part of that is that a strategy like that only works if we live in a community where we think get refusal is a problem. That once we've established get refusal is not okay, people will do a lot to avoid the label of get refuser. And so we really try to set it up so that there's that public understanding before a specific case happens. And you were going to give a second example. Yeah, so my second story is that we got a call from a woman a few years ago who was coming out of a very physically abusive relationship, us also other forms of control. So all of the factors where we would normally be really concerned about this get. 
And it happened to come out in our conversation that she had a prenup. Her husband was explicitly saying, I'm holding on to the get until you can't have children anymore, and was very open about that. So we connected her with the bait in to enforce the prenup, <clears throat> with an attorney who could support her. And we got a call a few weeks later that the get was given. And we wouldn't have gotten that call without the prenup. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we really see that the people who need it sign it and that it makes such a difference. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> one of the, I'll get myself in trouble, I guess. I guess, my colleagues. One of the criticisms that sometimes is leveled out there is that not all rabbis will have their congregants or their, their marriages signed prenups. What, what's your experience? Are, are most rabbis in the centrist Orthodox, modern Orthodox world supportive? Are, are there people who are vehemently opposed to it? Are there people who, you know, and without names, but are there people who will stand behind the person who is not behaving correctly. Well, how does it work? It's a great question. And unfortunately, well, I'll say first that I think we've really got into a place where in the modern Orthodox community, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm getting over a little bit of a cold, not coronavirus, thank God. Um, but we've come to a place in the modern Orthodox community where this is really the norm. And we're seeing very few situations of rabbis <coughs> excuse me, who don't support the prenup. However, we do see situations in active get refusal cases where unfortunately sometimes the get refuser does have a network of support and it's very problematic. And I think that's why we really need a community understanding that get refusal is never okay. Because if we sort of say that get refusal, it's not so nice, but in some situations it's allowed, then when we know a person and we're connected to that person, we make excuses. And that really impacts sort of the ability to make good decisions and good policy. So that's why we really feel you need that bottom line policy that this is not okay. And, you know, when I first started in the rabbit, it's, the rule used to be was go through your civil divorce. And then after your civil divorce, again, nowadays, it's Take care of the get as quickly as you can, whether it's before the civil divorce or during the civil divorce or after. Is that the common experience also around the country? Definitely. And that's a lot of the work that we've done is to try and push the get earlier. And I think it's for a few reasons. Part of it is that it gets nastier as you go. But also we worry a lot about extortion, about this sense of, sure, I'd love to give you a get, but here are 10 things that I need in return, shouldn't be a problem. And we want to really avoid that dynamic. And there's a problem that sometimes by saying, oh, we're going to keep the get till the end of the civil, there's kind of a feeling of an insurance policy. I'm going to put this in my back pocket. And if I don't like the divorce terms, this is my opportunity to renegotiate. Mm -hmm. So we really feel like the best faith thing to do is deal with the get early. No one's trying to extort each other. And we can all move forward and resolve things in really an ethical way. Have you ever had experiences with igunim, with men whose wives didn't want to accept the get? We have. We work with a number of igunim, however you pronounce it, and it's interesting. It's very similar. We get very few of those cases relatively, but when we have them, it's a form of domestic abuse, it's about control, and it's just going the other direction. So we're very open if people are listening and need help with the situation, we're very open to helping anyone, regardless of gender, who's struggling with this and giving them information and guidance and advocacy if it's at that point. So just to shift for a little bit to today to how things are nowadays, um, there's a lot of anecdotal reports that uh, during COVID, that um, there's a lot more marital strife. Uh, I can imagine it's because there's a lot more tensions and a lot more pressures and anxiety and any kind of issues probably get magnified. Uh, has it translated to the question of Agunot as well? Definitely. First of all, we, the vast majority of people who call us are survivors of domestic abuse or are still in situations of domestic abuse. And COVID-19 has been very dangerous because all of the 
sort of opportunities for relief and escape that you used to have, you know, going to work, going to see friends, all of those things have been taken away. So in general, it's a very tough time. And of course, in the beginning, both courts and Batidin, religious courts, were not really operating. And they're starting to operate, but it's very slow. And we're also seeing people deal with custody situations. How do you do a custody transfer if one parent was exposed to COVID, but is not taking it seriously, for example? And there's really not a lot of guidance on how to deal with that because there is no case law on what to do in a global pandemic. It's brand new. And so a lot of the people we're working with are trying to deal with all of these new situations, but without a lot of the social support that they might have had before. And we're actually planning a support group for Agunod as one of the ways to kind of beef up that sense of support because it's such an isolating time for everyone and especially for Agunod. And it's uh, in this COVID, I know in, in Chicago actually at KINS, the CRC Begdin, where Rabbi Reese is the Avdeitin, has been using our shul for Gitten. Uh, initially, they were doing Gitten outside in our parking lot. And then when they needed to be inside in our auditorium, socially distanced to the max to try to keep the Gitten going. So it was a couple of weeks where things were shut down, but then things opened up pretty quickly. Our other Beit ba- ba- Din, like you said, they're beginning to open up as the Beit Din of America. Those Beit ba- Din are opening up already? Absolutely. So Beijing of America has been running and or- arranging gets in. I will say, I think in Chicago, you're a little spoiled with that, Rabbi Reese, with the amazing team that you have. And we have very close connections with Beit of America and many other incredible Bate Din here. But one of the things that makes our work interesting is that we work with a very wide range of Bate Din. So there are some that are doing everything they can to find an, a creative way to move things forward. And some that are like, eh, we'll see in November what the story is. And you really have that range. So sometimes it's us trying to push the bait to no, you can do this. It's possible to have a socially distanced get. Let me connect you with someone who's done it recently. So sometimes it's us having to push for that. And in other cases, Bati Din have been enormously creative in having hearings and get ceremonies and everything that needs to be done, even with the travel limitations and the safety issues. Are in, in the Haredi community, is there a, a lot of movement also in terms of prenup? I know in Chicago, Rabbi First, Rabbi Senderovic from Milwaukee are also willing to work with a prenup. Uh, there's a special version of the prenup, prenup for Beit Din that they're together with, with Rabbi Reese. Uh, is, is that something that's happening nationally? Where in the Haredi community, they're getting more on board? They really are. And this, that's a huge surprise to me. Because I would have said, we're not going to see much movement for five to 10 years in the Haredi community. And already this year, there are multiple new versions of the prenup targeted towards a Haredi audience. There was a cover of Mishpacha magazine, Should We Sign a Prenup? Um, It's really moving. And so I'm really excited to see what happens next because it's really become a national conversation. And there's support. (coughs) When we talk about rabbis who are pro or rabbis who unfortunately, let's say, are not pro. Is it across the board? Well, you know, when all the all the segments of the Orthodox community, you'll find examples of those, both pro and the other? I would say in the centrist community, it's primarily pro. In the Haredi community, you'll have a hard time. It's not that there's no one who's pro, but I think it's challenging to find someone who's pro and is willing to put their name on that that it's still politically complicated. And usually because a lot of people ask, you know, what's the resistance? Why wouldn't someone be excited about the prenup? And typically while people may bring up halakhic issues, what we find is that often the core resistance is what I like to call the ick factor. It just seems yucky, you know, you have a young couple and they're getting married and it's so happy and why bring up all of this gloomy divorce stuff? And so we really try to sort of rewrite that script by presenting the prenup, not as something you do because you need one. I would hope that if you're signing it because you think you need it, you go uh, reevaluate that instead of, you know, getting, signing a prenup and getting married. 
that it's something you do for someone else. And it's something that we do because we're from Jews and we care about each other. And if someone out there is gonna have this problem and there's something I can do to address it, what a great opportunity. And so we try to frame it that way, but I think it takes time for that message to really go into other forms of the community and for it not to seem like a, a sort of pre-divorce process. I had the opportunity, and I don't think you know this story, um, right after I, um, Yitzhak Yosef was appointed chief, a Sephardic chief rabbi of Israel, I was in a series of meetings both with him and Rabbi David Lau, and Rabbi Willig joined me for the meeting with, with Rabbi Yitzhak Yosef. And uh, one of the things Rabbi uh, Willig presented with him with is his father's written haskamah approbation to the prenup. And I was in the room, it was, there were five of us in the room, and I was in the room and he got so excited when he saw that his father had endorsed the prenup. He asked for a copy of it. He wanted to make sure. And he and Rabbi Willig had this wonderful exchange. Rabbi Willig, for those who aren't aware, is the primary author of the prenup. And um, it was this moment where all of a sudden they say, oh, you know, the American prenup may not be that bad. In Israel, there's a number of other variations as well. Uh, one also done, another connection with KINS, Rabbi David Meshelov has a prenup in Israel which is pretty widely accepted. His father had been one of my predecessors at KINS. So oh, wow. Weddings in Israel, I've used his prenup because legally in Israel, it's apparently the one that we use is a little complicated to use legally in Israel. But in, in your work, what do you find to be the most challenging and the most rewarding part? Rewarding, I have a feeling I know. <laughs> Very good question. So in terms of the challenging part, I would say kind of the irony for me personally is that I really like getting along with people and having good relationships with people. And so it's a little ironic that I ended up in a field where there is conflict. And I think it's conflict with Shem Shemayim, but it does involve us being really clear about what we think is right and having hard conversations with people. And so I do it, but I, I have never enjoyed fighting. I still don't. Standing outside someone's house with a bullhorn and saying, you need to give a get. I do it, I've done it, um, but it, it does kind of break my heart a little when we have to do it, and I think that's a good thing, but it is a challenge. And um, in terms of the reward, one thing that I've heard from a number of Aguno right after they get their get, they say sort of a similar thing. And one thing that many people have said is that, oh my gosh, I didn't realize how stuck I was, how big a shadow this had until it was gone. And now that it's gone, I feel so much more free and it's such a difference. And so we really see that, you know, the get is one piece. They don't necessarily have a, a magically perfect life after the get's given. There are usually a lot of other complicated things they have to deal with. But with this piece resolved, it really gives them a sense of freedom just on a, an internal level. It's not even about, am I going to get remarried tomorrow or not? but really feeling within yourself that you're free to get to the next chapter in your life and being able to help someone get to that place is a real honor. And I think we feel very fortunate when we get to be the shaliach of that in someone else's life. Do you follow up? Is there, you know, five years out, is there a follow up with, with people who got their gitten or people who've worked with Oro? It's a very good question. We actually um, have been working with Dr. Palkovitz on a study that does some follow-up with former Agunot. So that's super interesting. We don't know specifically who says what because the, the point of the study is that it's anonymous. And I would say just otherwise, sort of anecdotally, people come back, people invite us to their weddings. They you know, send us pictures of you know, my new husband and my kids and really that next stage of life. And some people, once they do this, they don't want to think about it because it's too painful and that's okay too. But we really do get to see often how it changes over the long term and how different it is. And at the end of the day, there are a lot of problems to work out in a divorce. But what's scary about the get for people is that it could potentially go on for you know 50 years. There isn't really that end date. And that's so terrifying, and it's such a difference for people to know that this piece is resolved. Well, what is, among the active cases you have, what's the longest someone has been in Aguna of those cases? 
the longest case they separated in 1974 and there's still no gap. Wow. And this is an extreme case. It's rare. There's mental illness involved. It's not your average Aguna case, thank God. But when we think about sort of how being afraid of the get impacts how you make decisions, people hear these stories and they're terrified of being that person. And so it can lead people to say, you know what, this is a terrible deal, but I'm going to take it so I can get my get. And it can lead people to make decisions because the fear is so profound. And when that fear is gone, it's such a difference for people. Can I don't know if you're breaking confidences. In that case from 1970, what does the husband want besides to get even? Is he asking for a million dollars? Is he? Well, you know, he the goalposts keep changing. So I don't know that there even is anything. I think this is almost the poster case of why you have to deal with these cases early. Because at this point, this man's identity is that he's a get refuser. If he was no longer a get refuser, I don't know what, who he is. I don't know if he knows who he is. He's really built his life. He was actually living in Israel. He fled to Cyprus to get out of the country. He gave up his entire life so that he could have this control and that he could really be a committed get refuser. And so once it's kind of woven into someone's identity, it's very, very hard to shake. And that's why we feel so strongly about getting in early. Because at this point, I mean, we I've met with him in person. I don't think there's anything he actually wants. He throws things out, but it always changes. If you were to tell him, sure, I have a million dollars in cash in the suitcase, it wouldn't be enough. So it's just, it's it's control, it's power, it's yes. control, it's identity. Absolutely. And the best way to avoid the problem is the prenup. Or actually, the best way is a happy marriage. <laughs> the best way is a happy marriage, absolutely. And now, how much do you, you know, in the olden days or in the future days, are you on the road a lot helping out people? Are you, you know, promoting Aura all over? Or now is it, everything I assume is virtual now? Yes, everything's virtual now, but normally we are traveling. Anytime we have the opportunity to go to a new city, we try to get everywhere. So go to the shuls, go to the schools. We were fortunate to be able to do that in Chicago last year. Um, and we love getting to know new communities. And we also love thinking about sort of who are the players in Jewish divorce, from the Kala teacher to the parents of the couple to the lawyers and judges in the courtroom, how can we educate all of those people about get refusal and about understanding that get refusal is really a form of abuse. And so we do a lot of kind of trying to travel and spread that word so that when people go through the divorce process, they're hopefully hearing about the prenup from a lot of sources. Hopefully they have a rabbi who says, I'm not going to marry you without it. But they also have a college teacher who mentions it and a cousin who mentions it and a friend who mentions it. And do the American judges get it now? Do you think it's widespread in Jewish communities that the secular judges understand? I don't. And I really think the secular judges generally don't understand. Very often judges are allergic to anything religious because of the constitutional issues. And it can be hard to understand. Well, if you can't remarry now anyway, then why is this such a big deal? And so we do a lot of work in explaining that abuse and control piece whenever we can, because I think if you don't understand that, it might seem like, okay, so, so what if you wait three years for a gay? You can't remarry now anyway. It can be hard for judges to understand that without that context. So Keshit, if there was one thing that you want people watching this to remember, what would be the most important thing? Oh, that's probably the hardest question you've asked. I would say the most important thing is that this is not an unfixable issue. And I personally have been involved in this issue for 10 years. And the world is so different now than it was in 2010 on this issue. There is so much we can do to fix this, but we really need all of your help. We're a seven person staff at Oro. We do a lot with seven people, but seven prenups are not gonna change the world. And it's really that buy-in from just individual people who are out there living your lives that allows us to make a change. And so 
If you're listening to just know that you, whoever you are, you have the potential to really make a change on this issue. And we need everyone's investment in order to really hopefully get to a place where Agunod are something we read about in history books and not something that we experience in our everyday lives and in our communities. Keshen, our time is up, and I think that's the perfect place to stop, that we can make a difference. And I thank you very much for your time, for the work you do on behalf of ORA. And the next time you're in Chicago, you're invited to KINS, not virtually, but in person. And please continue to help all of Claudia with your amazing work. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Take care. What a pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.